Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Opportunities to Increase Cash Flow During COVID-19. We will be saving time at the end of the webcast to answer your questions. To ask our presenters a question, please type it in the Q&A window and click Submit. If we don't have time to answer your question, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. In addition to today's presentation, Moss Adams has many resources to help you navigate COVID-19. You can find links to these resources in the slide deck and handouts widget to the left of the slide view. Finally, the material appearing in this presentation is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as advice of any kind including without limitation, legal, accounting, or investment advice. And with that, I will turn it over to today's moderator, Rob Granham. Great, thank you, Emily. Good morning, everyone, or uh, possibly afternoon uh, if you're on the East Coast. And thank you for joining today's presentation on the employee retention tax credits uh, for the healthcare industry. My name is Rob Granham. I'm a tax partner and regional industry group leader for healthcare practice uh, here at Moss Adams. And I'm pleased to be joined with my colleagues, uh, Mary Caitlin Wilkets, Seth Dorn, and Gabe, Gabe Cermino. Uh, this team works exclusively in our tax credits and incentive pra incentives practice at Moss Adams. Uh, they work closely with our clients to identify, apply, and qualify various federal, state, and local tax credit opportunities across a broad spectrum of industries, uh, jurisdictions, and various business functions, including disaster relief, uh, hiring credits, R&D, fixed assets, and various transferable credits across industries, and many more. The employee, tax, employee retention tax credit is a new credit that was born out of the uh, CARES Act to incentivize employee retention during this COVID, COVID pandemic uh, time period. And actually, it's turned out to be one of the more advantageous tax provisions in the Act. We're seeing uh, some very positive impact on, on in clients' cash flow across a variety of industries, especially in the healthcare space. With that, today, our agenda, we're going to discuss the uh, employee retention tax credit eligibility, provide some examples, uh, talk through some of the documentation requirements and how to calculate uh, the claim. And then we'll, we'll discuss a few state level programs, uh, notably the California Employment um, a training panel, um, as well as we'll touch on a few other notable federal tax incentive programs that uh, many of our clients in the healthcare space are, are taking advantage of. And with that, I will turn it over to Mary Caitlin. Great, thank you, Rob. So as part of the CARES Act, the Employee Retention Tax Credit which we'll be referring to during this presentation as the ERTC. It provides a refundable tax credit for certain qualifying employers to offset quarterly employment taxes. So the credit is currently available for wages paid after March 12th and before uh, January 31st. The credit is 50% of the first 10,000 in eligible wages paid per qualified employee over all qualified quarters. Um, the credit is reviewed on a quarter by quarter basis, so employers do need to assess each quarter that they continue to qualify. The credit is used to offset the employer's social security taxes. However, the employer is eligible to reduce all employment taxes, so that includes federal withholdings and the employer and employee portions of both. Social Security tax, and Medicare tax. So employers can reduce all employment taxes with the credit generated, and any excess credit may be refunded. So a common concern uh, from employers is that they will be assessed penalties for not depositing the employment taxes prior to reporting the credit on their 941 payroll tax returns. Um, and because of that, the IRS issued a notice, uh, so it's notice 2020-22, which provides relief from any penalties if the employer utilizes the ERTC. Um, it also provides relief for employers who are taking advantage of the payroll tax deferral program. In general, uh, employers may claim the credit on the qualified quarter's 941 uh, payroll tax return. Once filed, the IRS will issue any applicable refund to the employer. 
Um, however, if an employer needs immediate cash, they can file a Form 7200 at any time during the quarter and as many times during that quarter as necessary um, to obtain a more immediate refund. To qualify, a business needs to have experienced one of the following. So the first being a partial or full suspension of operations due to a governmental order that limited commerce or travel as a result of COVID-19. This does not include businesses that suspended part or all of their business just to conserve cash. They must qualify as a business required to suspend part or all of the business because of a, a governmental order. So that's really important to note. Um, you know, it's also important to know that determining um, partial suspensions may be tricky. And in some cases, uh, employers may need to consult with their business attorney to confirm if they do meet uh, the partial suspension. The second um, option is employers who experienced a significant decline in gross receipts. Uh, so the test for this is that the gross receipts in the current calendar quarter must be less than 50% of the gross receipts reported in the same calendar quarter in the prior year. Um, and as mentioned, you know, these qualifications must be reviewed each quarter to ensure that the business is still either experiencing that partial or full suspension or um, a decline in gross receipts. It is important to note that if, a, if an employer qualifies um, with a partial suspension in Q2 and then the you know, business is back up to normal, but then for some reason in Q3 experience a significant decline in gross receipts, they can qualify in Q3 under a different um, one of these other factors. So it doesn't have to be the same for all quarters to qualify. So the ERTC is available to both taxable and tax exempt employers. Um, if an employer uses a professional employment organization or a certified professional employment organization, for purposes of the ERTC, the common law employer is the eligible party for the credit. So that's regardless of who is paying the wages. The common law employer is also the party assessed when determining the employee headcount for further determining what wages are eligible for the retention credit. And Seth will be discussing this um, in more detail shortly. But it's also um, important to know that governmental employers, including those who are an agency or and instrumentality of the government are excluded from the credit. And to help businesses determine if they are considered an instrumentality of the government, the IRS provided some information and in, um, in their FAQs to further kind of expand on this. So what you see here on the slide are six factors that the IRS provided that they used to consider um, when determining if a business is a instrumentality of the government. All right, looks like time for a polling question. Which of the following does your business operate as? And your options are A, for-profit entity, B, not-for-profit, C, a government entity, or D, other. I will give everyone a few moments to respond. To participate in our polls today, please click the button next to the answer you choose and click Submit. A few more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Great, Emily. It looks like uh, it's pretty evenly split between for-profit and not-for-profit uh, with entities and maybe a couple other and zero governmental entities. 
I think with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Seth. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be getting into a few more details behind the retention credit. Um, one, of, one of the other gating questions, in addition to what Mary Kaelin was mentioning, one gating question to ask is whether or not the business has received PPP funding. Uh, businesses that have taken PPP loans are disqualified from taking the retention credit. The retention credit is really meant to be an alternative to the, the PPP program. So um, that's sort of another eligibility issue there. The, the retention credit also has aggregation rules. They're similar to the PPP aggregation rules, but um, slightly different. But that goes to say that if, if anybody, if any business within the aggregated group had received PPP loans, that would disqualify the whole group. And um, similarly, if, if there's an aggregated group that has operations in multiple jurisdictions and um, only one of those jurisdictions has a, an appropriate government order in place, that would qualify as a partial suspension for the entire aggregated group, so um, across multiple jurisdictions. And the, the last bullet there, those are a few examples of um, groups of businesses that would be aggregated for purposes of the retention credit, um, which comes out of the, the Internal Revenue Code. And so once it's established that the business is an eligible employer, uh, the, the next issue is to calculate qualified wages that have been paid. And that calculation differs depending on the size of the business. So businesses with 100 or fewer full-time employees, the credit is based on wages paid to all employees, regardless of whether they are performing services. And for larger employers with more than 100 full-time employees, the credit is based on wages paid to employees while they are not providing services. The idea is that you, you kept uh, employees on the payroll during COVID-19, even though they, they weren't able to work. Um, and, and then you can receive this credit for, for those wages. And, and the calculation of whether you're above or below that 100 employee threshold uh, is based on the average 2019 headcount. And again, the aggregation rule applies. So um, if you have several smaller businesses, they could combine to get you over that 100 employee threshold. And as with any tax issue, once you get into um, kind of the nuance of what is a qualifying government order, what is a partial suspension, the analysis can get um, a little more nuanced and a little more complicated. And I should also note that we're going to reference these IRS FAQs a fair amount. Um, there's about 100, I think 100 or so questions that the IRS um, issued and provided answers to. There's a lot of uncertainty in this area still. This is, you know, still a very new credit, and um, just there's not a lot of uh, practical experience with it at this point. And these FAQs actually go out of their way to to note that they're not um, legally binding. So um, I guess just just be aware of that. Uh, th so the IRS provides a few examples of what qualifying government orders are. Um, you know, a city's mayor saying that all non-essential businesses must close, or a state emergency proclamation that residents must shelter in place, or a local official imposing a curfew on residents that uh, impact the operating hours of a trade or business are all examples of, of valid government orders. And on the issue of uh, what exactly is a partial suspension of operations or what is not a partial suspension of operations, the FAQs indicate that if a government order is in place for, for people to stay at home and so an essential business is customers are not able to come to their business, that does not qualify as a partial suspension 
of operations for that essential business. Um, also, if a business voluntarily suspends operations, just out of an abundance of caution, or like Mary Kaylin indicated, to conserve cash, that would not qualify. And, and in the case where a government order does require you to close your workplace, but you're able to continue operations that are comparable to when you were open via employees that telework, that would not qualify, nor would a kind of a general state of emergency um, that, that a state might issue. A few examples of what does qualify um, are included here, and, and specifically to the healthcare industry. Um, again, there's no real specific guidance on this, but um, our interpretation and um, reading the FAQs kind of as a whole, um, the government orders that have required healthcare providers to partially suspend their operations by um, suspending or postponing non-emergency and elective procedures could qualify as a, uh, as a partial suspension of operations or in the example of medical and dental clinics that have reduced hours, that would also likely qualify. And so the other way to qualify as an eligible employer for the, the retention credit is if you've seen a significant decline in gross receipts. And like Mary Caitlin indicated, that's, that is a 50% or greater decline in gross receipts over the same calendar quarter in 2019. And as long as, as long as you you know get to that 50% threshold for one quarter, your eligibility continues until your your revenues are back up to 80% of the, the prior quarter, um, or sorry, of the same quarter in the prior year. And here are a few examples of what the uh, IRS has indicated are gross receipts. So it would be total sales, uh, income from investments, and incidental or outside sources. Um, I think, yeah, on this next slide, this has been kind of an interesting issue for, um, and it sounds like we have a fair amount of nonprofit entities on the call. Um, it, it's not exactly clear what what are gross receipts for a nonprofit entity. The IRS has indicated that they're going to issue additional guidance, so um, we're hoping to see that sooner than later, obviously, as the end of the quarter is, is coming up quickly. And so what we've been helping a lot of clients with is documenting their eligibility, and we think this is an important step. Um, and in some situations, it's pretty obvious that um, employers qualify and others, it's a little less obvious. And so we think it's important to um, just do that thorough analysis, document it, and have that in a file um, in, in case of an audit when you're, if you're claiming the credit. Um, in some situations, that's very clear and obvious and, and doesn't take a lot of effort. In other cases, it, I think it takes a little more uh, effort to kind of build the, the case that you do qualify. And then the next piece that we recommend documenting that is can be also complicated is um, documenting when uh, employees were not providing services. If you're if you're over that hundred employee threshold. Uh, we've seen some employers incorporate uh, a special time coding um, category for when employees are not working, um, and that helps to track track those wages. It looks like we're to another polling question, Emily. All right, our next polling question: How many employees does your whole organization have? And your options are A. 0 to 50, B, 50 to 150, C, 150 to 300, 
or D, more than 300. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts to the left of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. Just a couple more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Great, so it looks like, this is Rob, it looks like uh, we do have some organizations, so uh, maybe upwards of 25, 30% that, that might be under the, the 100 employee count and uh, you might wanna take a, a good look at that because there are, it's a little bit more liberal as far as the credit opportunities for 100 or fewer uh, compared to uh, 100 or more. With that, I think uh, we'll go back to, back to Seth. Yeah, thanks, Robin. And now we'll get into a few more details of how you calculate those qualified wages and, and do the calculation of the credit. Uh, as Mary Caitlin indicated earlier, the credit is calculated at 50% of up to $10,000 um, of qualified wages paid to, to eligible employees. So there's a, a maximum credit of $5,000 per employee. And Wages include both, you know, what you think of as wages paid to the employed, employee and as well as health plan expenses that are allocable to those qualified wages. Um, and that includes both the employer portion of the health plan expense and the employee pre-tax pre um, health plan expense that they pay. Well, and, and that last bullet there, only employers with less than 100 employees may also include uh, PTO wages. Withholding and other employment taxes are still required on these wages. Um, and, and one good opportunity we've seen is where furloughed employees um, have stopped receiving wages, but they the employer continues to pay their health plan expenses. Those health plan expenses that are paid, even though the employees not receiving other wages would qualify for the credit. So you could take 50% of those health plan expenses as a credit. Hey Seth, I just wanna, if you could just clarify real quick again, the use of PTO in this. Yeah, I'll go back. And that's, so that would just be for smaller employers where they can, they can include PTO in that calculation of qualified wages. And so we have a, a small sample calculation here. For to keep it simple, we uh, we assumed that we were below the 100 employee threshold. Every employee is getting paid $15 an hour and working 40 hours a week. And at, you know, for a 10 week period, the operations were partially suspended. And so, and, but the employees continued to be paid. Um, and that's the $450,000 there. Total wages were $585,000. And the credit is 50%, $225,000 of the qualified wages a couple lines above. And, and I'll get into this a little bit more in a minute, but um, the way we've done the calculation here is we've assumed that the withholding, the social the, uh, employer and employee social security tax and the employer and employee Medicare tax were all uh, essentially short paid and which would leave a remaining refund of $18,494. So ultimately, the, the retention credit is um, is going to be claimed and reconciled on the Q2 941, or you know, if you continue to be an eligible employer, it could carry through to Q3 and Q4. Um, but but the new 941 form, and it's, I think it's still in draft form, <clears throat> has lines on it for this credit and, and reconciling it with um, any refunds you might have received. 
um, if, if you don't want to wait till the end of the quarter, um, even though we're getting near it now, you can also file the Form 7200 to, um, to claim the refund immediately and, and get that cash sooner. Um, the other option that I alluded to is to actually apply the, the credit to your other employment taxes, such as withholding, um, Medicare, and the employee's share of Social Security. You can apply it to those deposits that you make throughout the quarter. Um, what we've seen from, from a number of clients is it's actually easiest to kind of keep the status quo for your, your payroll tax compliance and then either file the 7200 to get the refund or to um, or to wait until the end of the quarter and, and claim it on the 941. Um, and, and the way the credit interacts with other um, other credits should be noted here. You, you can't use the same wages to calculate the work opportunity tax credit or the um, Family First Coronavirus Relief Act. So that was the expanded um, expanded Family and Medical Leave Act. That said, you, you can claim both credits um, on the same employee. So if, if they're subject to the FFCRA extended leave provisions, you can get that credit for the first two weeks while they're on uh, extended leave. And then if you continue to pay them after that uh, leave period, then you could claim the retention credit on wages paid to that employee. And, and there is um, a rule in the statute that, we, that does not allow you to pay them more. So you could you know, kind of manipulate this to increase the credit. Um, you have to, um, the only amount of wages that qualify for the credit are those up to what they had um, received in the previous 30 days. Hey, so another, hey Beth, real quick on, yeah. well, I was, I was going to say on, on the previous slide, maybe can you speak to um, if the employer didn't uh, timely figure out their full benefit on on the second quarter filing, and they they find opportunity after the fact for the second quarter in the third quarter. What can they do in that regard? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Good question. Um, and if if you determine that you're eligible for the credit, you can claim it and and get a refund for it. I, I believe as long as the statute of limitations would be open. Um, and so. Uh, you would, in that case, I think you would file the Form 7200 to claim a refund of the, um, you know, Social Security tax that you paid in that qualified for the retention credit. And the other provision that we've seen kind of interacting with the retention credit is the Social Security tax deferral. And so this is another provision of the CARES Act, I believe, that allows employers to defer the employer's share of Social Security until the end of 2021, 50% till the end of 2021, and 50% until the end of 2022. Um, you can take advantage of both of these provisions. So you can uh, defer the under the deferral and also get the retention credit. And um, the FAQs are actually kind of interesting on this. Um, you, can, you can get the full retention credit refunded immediately and, and then pay the 50% at the end of 21 and 2022. I think we're to the next polling question. All right, our next poll. Is your organization taking advantage of the ERTC? And your options are A, yes, B, no, it doesn't apply, C, no, but we should be, or D, I'm not sure. We do have a lot of uh, questions coming in. Uh, keep submitting questions. Even if we don't have time to answer them uh, during the presentation, we will still do our best to follow up with you after. 
And just another moment here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Okay, great. Thanks, Emily. Um, so it looks like maybe just a quarter of folks are uh, are taking the credit and uh, the rest are either not or not sure yet. So hopefully this uh, this presentation will get you a little uh, a little bit further down the road as far as whether this does make uh, make good economic sense for your organization. With that, um, we'll move to uh, Gabe, I believe, who will uh, take over the next handful of slides. Gabe. Thanks, Rob. Um, so before I, I move on to some state considerations, just a, a final wrap up on the ERTC in terms of how we can help. Uh, we've covered a lot of information today. Um, it can be a little tricky to determine eligibility, qualified wages for employees. So you know, we can definitely help walk you through that business eligibility and, and qualified employees kind of discussion. It can help you calculate the credit each quarter, ensuring that you're capturing the qualified wages and healthcare expenses. It can also help you with the Form 7200 for that you know immediate refund of the credit if that's something that uh, you think you want to pursue. Um, so you know, lots of moving pieces with this credit, and we're we're here to kind of help along the way. Um, now, switching gears over, uh, we'd like to talk about a program in California that has recently been implemented that specifically is looking to help companies recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and is particularly relevant to the healthcare sector. Um, California has an existing training grant program called the Employment Training Panel. And this program provides funds to employers who offer structured training programs to its employees. And so this program is discretionary and competitive and offers a cash grant reimbursement um, process has typically been you apply for funding based on the type of training you're offering. Um, you develop that application with uh, staff at the state. And then finally, the panel is going to award grant funding to help offset costs associated with the training. Recently, during its, its May meeting, the panel adopted a response plan designed to assist companies in recovering from the pandemic. And part of this plan um, was to create the rapid reemployment and retraining pilot. Thankfully, they've shortened that to COVID pilot. It's easier for me to say. Um, and by creating the COVID pilot, the state is looking to support industries that it feels are critical to the health and welfare of Californians, as well as, you know, playing a crucial part in keeping the economy operational during the pandemic. And therefore, it's specifically looking to focus uh, this, this uh, funding on employers in the healthcare and food supply chain. So um, I think it's particularly relevant here, so we wanted to make sure we, we, we brought it up. So what is available? Um, again, it's a cash reimbursement grant for training provided to new hires for up to four hours of their training. And so um, important to note, for the purposes of this pilot, a new hire can be you know, someone new that you haven't employed before or can be a rehired worker or recalled worker who had been laid off as a result of the, the pandemic. Um, that's a new uh, kind of twist on the pilot. The existing program doesn't offer uh, training to be eligible for reimbursement if it's a rehire, but this pilot is specifically saying that rehired workers are eligible. Um, another way that the pilot's a little bit different in, is that the eligible training is relatively broad. Um, the, under the parent program, certain types of training were eligible but the pilot has really opened up the eligibility and offers funding for just about any training associated with new hires. Uh, the only exception really being any mandated federal or state training. Um, so one part uh, in our discussions with the state and what they're really looking to do is also try to capture any training specific to COVID related safety training. Uh, is that something they're really looking to, to fund with this program? Um, as you can see, we've listed the kind of the, the caps of the award and the training. It's, it's capped at $2,000 per employee with a maximum award of $200,000. Um, so, again, the cash grant uh, reimbursement, so that would be cash back in the door for uh, training that you may already be doing. 
Um, as far as eligible industries, um, as we mentioned, the pilot is is focused on on healthcare and the food supply chain, and they've really looked to kind of provide a broad uh, definition of of the healthcare for this for this pilot. Um, they they're going to use uh, NAICS codes. Um, stands for the North American Industry Classification System, and they're going to use those codes to determine eligibility. And we've listed the codes here to kind of give you an idea of just how broad uh, they're looking to kind of define the healthcare sector. Um, healthcare 62 and the next code is the sector code for the entire healthcare industry, and it, it includes a lot of operations and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and work. It, it covers hospitals, physicians' offices, outpatient care centers, ambulance centers, dentists. It, it covers a broad spectrum, really the whole industry. And then we've also listed um, some of the more specific, specified codes to include, you know, employers within the broader health industry, you know, pharmacies, medical and pharmaceutical manufacturing, medical equipment manufacturing, you know, including, you know, manufacturers of personal protective equipment, uh, stuff like you know, the types of activity that the state feels is really helping the, the economy continue during the, during the pandemic. Um, now, how, how to get the, uh, the funding? Um, the, the, the pilot has been streamlined to really kind of uh, fast track the application process. Typically, the the parent program had a, a 90 day application period where you submit a preliminary application and you would develop that application with a specialist assigned by the state. And then you would also have a site visit by that specialist. And then finally, you would present this application to the panel who would approve the contract. Well, given the state of the economy, this pilot is designed to be a much quicker turnaround and get the funding to the employers uh, in a more streamlined fashion. So. While you will still need to follow the same steps and the pre-application, et cetera, um, by indicating that you're applying under the COVID pilot, you're going to get be prioritized and fast-tracked. Um, and one of those ways they fast-track is they're no longer requiring the site visit. Uh, they're they're you know placing these applications at the top of the list to make sure that the funding can be allocated and, and, and get back in get back to the employers who are training and employing people. Um, again, the application for the pilot is, is less detailed. Um, the compliance aspect is less, uh, is more flexible and more, and more streamlined. So they're really trying to take away the administrative burden with this and get funding back to, to employers. Uh, as far as timing, the panel is going to start approving contracts with this pilot in, on its July 24th meeting. And we'll be offering the pilot through the end of the calendar year. Um, they may extend it depending on funding, but um, you know, we would we would suggest considering filing an application sooner rather than later. Uh, the parent program has had backlogs for for months. Uh, we don't expect similar backlogs, but we do expect this pilot to be popular and it would make sense to get an application filed sooner if if you had training that you were conducting. Um, again, how how can we help? Um, similar to the ERTC, we can help. You know determine the eligibility for the pilot, make sure that you're in, within one of those next codes. And if not specific next codes, maybe we can help work with the state to see if they have any flexibility within that that list of, uh, of codes. Uh, we can help with the development of the preliminary and the full application, as well as the compliance process. Um, so from beginning to end, we can help with the with this process to help you get some cash back in the door. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn it over to Mary Caitlin, who's going to talk about some other federal incentive programs. Great, thanks, Gabe. So yeah, so lastly, we're going to shift and briefly discuss two federal tax credit programs um, that can be a great incentive for healthcare employers. So the first is the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program, uh, which is also referred to as WAPSI. Uh, this is important um, to also note for employers who may have had to, um, you know, lay off a lot of employees. And as you know, 
things sort of kind of get back to normal um, and begin filling those positions, you know, the WASI program could be something that could be very beneficial from a federal income tax perspective. So the WASI program, it's a wage-based incentive for employers to hire individuals who may be facing barriers to employment. Um, so primarily those receiving some form of government assistance. And you know, by hiring these individuals, not only are employers getting a tax credit, but it also allows an opportunity for the individual to become more self-sufficient and ultimately get off government assistance and back into the workforce. The WATI program consists of about 14 different uh, targeted groups to capture those individuals most vulnerable to unemployment. And we'll go over those target groups um, shortly. The WATI does provide for a dollar for dollar credit against the federal income taxes owed. And separate from the other tax credit programs we discussed uh, today, this is a non-refundable credit. Um, so because it's non-refundable, you know, any excess credit that the company generates um, beyond their income tax liability in the current year. Um, because this is also a general business credit, that then allows it to have a 20-year carry forward. So you can carry forward unused credit for up to 20 years with this program. The WATI is available to both taxable and tax-exempt employers. Um, however, tax-exempt employers are limited to um, only new hires who would qualify under veteran targeted groups. So not all of the um, targeted groups available under the WATSI program would be available to new hires for tax-exempt employers. Um, and I'll kind of show you those in a second. Um, and, you know, for tax-exempt employers, the credit that is generated is used to offset FICA taxes. So this is a prospective program, so it's not something that employers can go back um, during the tax year and try to figure out what employees might qualify. This is something that employers need to implement as part of a, um, you know, an application onboarding type process. Um, it does have a 28-day um, statutory filing window for any qualified applications to be filed, so there is a time requirement with this, this program. Um, typically, for larger employers, uh, the the you know what we call screening, which is um, you know how you determine if your new hires qualify. Typically, this is an automated process in, integrated into existing um, onboarding applicant tracking systems or onboarding systems, and managed by outsourced providers, so that the administrative burden is not on the employer. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, as businesses begin to reopen and hire new employees, you know, many may be able to take advantage of the WASI and, you know, specifically because there were so many people who were laid off and lost their jobs and had to resort to unemployment benefits in order to supplement their income during COVID. And um, with this WASI program, those who were laid off and, re and hired back with a new employer and those who had received those uh, unemployment benefits could qualify the business for the credit. So as a result of COVID, this could actually turn into a significant tax credit for uh, for-profit employers. However, something to note, um, currently furloughed employees who are brought back on or rehired employees would not be eligible. So it was only brand new employees with a company who have no prior employment record. So something to keep in mind. So to get an idea of how material this credit can be, <clears throat> on your screen you'll see a listing of the current targeted groups and the maximum amount of credit each um, qualified new hire may generate for the employer. So on the left-hand side of the table, these are general target groups. And on the right-hand side, these are the veteran target groups. So these veteran groups, these are the ones that are applicable to the tax-exempt um, employers. And as you can see, there's it, the credit amount, the maximum credit amount varies depending on the targeted group. 
Um, and, you know, to kind of give you an example, with healthcare clients, we typically see a number of individuals qualifying under food stamps, um, the um, either short or long-term TANF, um, as well as the unemployment um, targeted groups. And since this is a wage-based credit, the amount of credit an employee generates is based off of their gross wages and gross hours. So you can see um, at the top of the slide, it kind of gives you an idea of, of the percentage the calculation is, um, is completed on depending on the number of hours they work within their first 12 months. So there's a maximum credit amount, but it's uh, dependent on the hours and wages and a qualified employee earns during their first year of employment. The other uh, federal program that we want to talk about is the Employer Paid Family and Medical Leave Credit. So this is separate and distinct from the FFCRA Paid Sick and Family Leave Credit that um, Seth had mentioned earlier. That was um, something that came out as a result of COVID-19. This is an incentive for employers who provide a voluntary paid family and medical leave plan as part of their benefit package. Um, and separate from any state mandated programs. The minimum requirement is that employers provide at least two weeks of paid leave at at least a 50% uh, rate. So that's kind of the minimum um, for an employer to qualify. The credit is wage-based and the percent the credit is calculated on is based on the percent of leave wages paid by the employer. So you can see on your screen, there's a little table. So if, if an employer pays a 50% rate for um, paid family medical leave, then the credit would be 12.5% of the wages paid. There's also a wage cap. Um, so this applies, so for 2020, this applies to employees who took qualified paid leave who made less than, who made 75,000 or less. So, as of right now, this credit is only available to taxable employers. Um, and again, you know, it's not a refundable credit, but it also is a general business credit with a 20 year carry forward for any unused credit. Employers in states with mandatory paid leave laws, this is a, this credit becomes really tricky in those states and employers may still be able to qualify, but the eligibility is very limited and in many cases does require further consultation with an employment law attorney to determine that the business does in fact qualify in those states that have mandatory paid leave laws. Um, and there's just a quick example here on your screen of kind of how the credit works, um, just to kind of show you, you know, just a quick example of, of um, the materiality of, of this program. You know, so, you know, how can we help um, as it relates to these federal programs? Uh, you know, here at Moss Adams, we have a full service outsource solution for the WASI program, um, you know, ultimately to minimize employer administrative burden. Um, and with that, we, we have a proprietary screening tool um, called Max Credit that, um, as mentioned before, it's uh, incorporated into automated um, applicant tracking or onboarding systems. Um, you know, there's kind of a list of some of the things that we do as part of our services. And then for the family and medical leave credit, um, you know, we can work with employers to determine and document um, their eligibility and, you know, who qualified employees are, as well as, you know, calculating um, the eligible credit for reporting on the federal return. So we do have a variety of, of resources available um, that provide additional information about um, you know, these programs, uh, especially the employee retention credit. Um, you know, as you can see, we have alerts, insights, and guidance listed here. And then we do have some upcoming recorded webcasts. Uh, as you can see, um, June 25th is our next webcast. And then we do have some uh, recorded uh, webcasts available to you um, if you're interested. Okay, I think uh, 
Emily, unless you tell me otherwise, I, I think we're at a point where we could uh, address some, some Q&A. Yep, we've got 10 minutes left for questions. So if you have a question for our presenters, um, you can keep entering those in the Q&A window. And Rob, I'll, I'll turn it back to you for the questions. Great. Well, we've had uh, we we have had a number of questions coming through, and there's some there's some common themes on some of them. And I'm just going to open this up to the team here. Um, and one of the questions is uh, uh, has to do with the use of vacation and or sick pay uh, for qualifying wages, and and maybe. Uh, you could just readdress that again. Uh, sounds like there's different rules if you're under or over 100 employees. Yes, thanks, Rob. This is Seth. I can I can comment on that. Um, and actually, before the IRS FAQs came out, it was kind of uh, understood amongst practitioners that PTO would qualify. The the FAQs, the guidance from the IRS came out and specifically said that they view PTO and sick pay that was accrued in periods prior to the partial shutdown, um, they view those as wages from the prior period and, and would not qualify for the credit. Now, for employers with fewer than 100 employees, since all wages uh, qualify for, uh, for the credit for those smaller employers, the, the PTO is included in that. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that's that's great, Seth. I think that helps clarify that that's a very common question we we hear. Um, the the other common question, and it's come up here, and I I know you touched on it, but maybe you can just uh, touch on it again. And that that's the use of uh, the health benefits qualifying as a as a qualifying wage, and uh, especially with regards to furloughed employees. Maybe you could just speak to that again. Yeah, yeah, and, and interesting kind of a, another case of the IRS FAQ said one thing and then they got some pressure from uh, legislators to change that position, which they did. And so as things stand right now, um, the health plan expenses, they that falls in the definition of qualified wages for purposes of the retention credit. And so if you, um, if you furloughed employees, and continue to pay their health plan expenses, those are viewed as qualified wages for the retention credit, and you can you can take the credit on you know fifty percent of those health plan expenses that were paid for for a lot of employees. Yeah, and that can be a big benefit. Those health benefits add up every month. One of the other common questions has to do with just eligibility, and the question is, um, if a business was considered essential, uh, can you still qualify for the employee retention tax credit if operations were were limited? Um, maybe maybe you could, uh, Seth or Mary Caitlin, you could speak to that component as well. Yeah, and so do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and Seth, feel free to jump in if <laughs> necessary. Um, so that's a really tricky question. Um, you know, with this, with the retention credit, you know, you, you have to look at not only state orders, but also county and city orders to um, kind of determine where, what is an essential business, um, you know, as defined by those, um, you know, government authorities and you know what kind of impacts the essential business experience you know most commonly essential businesses would qualify under the gross receipts test um, but you know when it comes to the partial suspension it's difficult to to really clearly be able to determine qualification because some some factors come into play you know if you're an essential business and your business was limited but your employees were able to work from home um, you know there's some guidance around if employees can telework and continue to perform comparable to um, how they performed when they were at a facility you know that kind of limits eligibility um, you know looking at you know is it 
is your business limited because your customers um, are under an order or is it which typically wouldn't qualify but if your business is limited because your supplier um, is under a government order to shut down and so you couldn't get the supplies you need to uh, be able to um, for your business to continue to perform, you know, that could be an area that you could qualify. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of different pieces and it's it varies business by business and jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Yeah, agreed. We you know, we would want to analyze the all of the facts and circumstances. Um but that said, being categorized as an essential business does not automatically disqualify you from taking the credit. If, if you're in a central business and your operations were partially suspended by a government order, you can still qualify. I think that's a that's a really important point and it gets down to, to kind of facts and circumstances and and where were you limited and 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 where where, where did you have situations where your employees couldn't function and do their job because of the, the partial shutdown. Um, another question, we've got a lot of great questions. I apologize in advance if we're not going to be able to get to your question, and we will do our best, uh, certainly offline, to do so. Um, but but a question was, can we, when we bring back furloughed employees, would we still be eligible? Uh, would we be eligible for the WOTC? Yeah, and that's a good, good question. And... Um, Unfortunately, furloughed employees or um, rehired, so if you ended up laying off employees and then you know, brought them back um, as rehired employees, unfortunately, neither of those situations would qualify. Uh, for the WASI, it has to be a brand new hire who does not have any prior employment history um, with the company. Okay. What about the question of can we increase our employee salaries during the qualifying period, this is for the ERTC, can we increase our employee salaries in order to maximize the credit during the particular quarter? Um, I can take this one. Uh, no, unfortunately, um, you know, the IRS prohibits employers from, from doing that specific thing. Um, so the amount of wages that are paid during um, you know the the period of eligibility should be comparable to what an employee would normally be paid um, during a um, I believe the the language is during a preceding uh, thirty day period. Got it. And what if uh, here's another question: If we do not have an immediate cash need, can we wait to claim the credit on the nine forty one, or do we need to file the seventy two hundred? I believe you can wait to file the 941. As again, the the Q2 941 is still in draft form and hasn't been officially released. But um, the way I understand the mechanics of that, you can claim the credit and get the refund through the the quarterly 941. Great. And then when we think about the um, quick. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. As I say, and just a quick comment, um, you know, for employers who do qualify for Q1, so from the period basically March 13th through March 31st, the Q1 portion of the credit is going to be claimed on the Q2 941. So employers don't need to, um, they can, the IRS has uh, requested that you consolidate um, Q1 and Q2 on the Q2 941. And I think just one more one more question that um, that I think I, I've kind of seen common threads through here, and, and that has to just do with qualifying wages all in and um, what qualifying wages includes and doesn't include. I know we've talked about accrued paid time off and accrued sick leave prior to the enactment date does not qualify as long as it was accrued prior to that period. What about accrued PTO or sick pay that accrued during the period that was paid out? and or health benefits for self-insured employers. You could address that. 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I think um, that's probably an area where there's some uncertainty. I think a, uh, a very strict reading of the FAQ uh, would say that if, if uh, CTO is accrued and paid during the uh, qualifying period, so while your operations are partially suspended, those should um, be qualified wages. If it's, if it's PTO that's accrued and paid um, while you're a, an eligible employer. And then if you're self-insured and for health benefit purposes, uh, those, maybe you could speak to those qualifying as wages. Yeah, yeah, they, they would. Um, and the guidance we have says that the employer's portion and um, the employee's pre-tax contribution to the health plan expense would qualify. Um, but I don't know if that, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it helps speak to it. And again, we're we're at the the time, so I'm going to hand it over to Emily, and we, we will all we will do our best to address uh, all the questions we didn't get to. But I'll turn it over to Emily at this point. All right, thank you, and thank you, Rob, Mary, Caitlin, Gabe, and Seth for a great presentation today. Uh, as Rob mentioned, we we did have a number of questions come in. Uh, we will be following up with you to the best of our ability after the webcast. Uh, you may also reach out directly to our presenters. Uh, using their contact information on this slide. And here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.